Okay. Well, it's very much my pleasure today to welcome Elizabeth Porridge Freeman um, to, to Rutgers virtually. Um, so welcome. Elizabeth Porridge Freeman is Associate Professor of Sociology and Senior Advisor to the President and Provost for Diversity and Inclusion at the University of South Florida. She received her uh, BA from Cornell University and her master's and PhD in sociology from Duke University. Dr. Horge Freeman published her first book, The Color of Love, Racial Fe Features, Stigma, and Socialization in Black Brazilian Families in 2015. The book was the recipient of multiple awards and honors. She is also co-editor of a volume titled Race and the Politics of Knowledge Production, Diaspora and Black Transnational Scholarship in the United States and Brazil, published in 2016. Also in 2016, Dr. Horge Freeman received a Fulbright Fellowship, a Ruth Landis Fellowship, and a USF Women in Leadership and Philanthropy grant to complete data collection for her current book project titled Second Class Daughters, Informal Adoptions as Modern Slavery in Brazil. This project, which I believe is almost finished, is based on nearly 10 years of ethnographic data and interviews on labor exploitation. Today, Dr. Horst Freeman will give a lecture titled Home is Where the Herd Is, Effective Capital, Stigma, and Racialization. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for that. What I'm going to try to do is actually share my screen and hopefully the technology will cooperate with me today. Let's see here. Let's see if I can make this happen. Are you all able to see this? Yeah. Yes. You can see this? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All righty. Well, thank you so much for um, that introduction and really for the opportunity for me to present to this group again. So uh, Dr. Larvivas has invited me before and it's always been a pleasure to speak to Brecker's uh, students. So what I'm going to try to do is present over the next 35 to 40 minutes and then give us plenty of time to answer questions or for you all to ask questions about, about this work. So today I'm looking forward to sharing research from my book, The Color of Love, Racial Features, Stigma, and Socialization in Black Brazilian Families. And so this book really examines how racial socialization practices in Black Brazilian families function to reproduce, resist, and manage racial and phenotypic hierarchies. And when we say phenotype, we're talking about um, racial features, characteristics, physical characteristics that we attach to racial categories, right? So how do, do those distinctions matter? Now, in this presentation, I'm gonna draw on one, maybe two chapters of my book in order to discuss how racial features can shape the distribution of affection in families. And speaking to this particular historic moment, I want to also end the presentation by uh, discussing the extent to which the Black Lives Matter movement, which is, now, which is a global movement, I wanna discuss how that's impacted some of the practices uh, that we see in Black families in Brazil and uh, across the world. So I hope we have chan a chance to talk about that later on. So over the past years, the past several years, you know, there's been an increasing interest in couples around the world who have had twins of a quote unquote different race, right? So each year I come across new pictures where siblings and sibling pairs and particularly twins are called uh, feats of humanity, right? They're called marvels of science. But for those of you who, who study racialization and might be familiar with the several centuries of extensive racial mixture uh, in Latin America, phenotypic variation, variation based on your physical characteristics your, um, among family members is actually not surprising. And all across Latin America and especially in Brazil, phenotypic variation is expected. So in countries like Brazil, having a baby is a bit like playing racial roulette because of the uncertainty about which racial features will emerge in the genetic lottery. And while for some folks, 
pictures of these phenotypically uh, diverse families carry the suggestion that racism has ended. In my research, I suggest something else, something much more complicated or complex occurs. Um, but I can show you this better than I can tell you. So I'd like you to take a picture or take a look at this 1895 painting from uh, the artist Modesto Brocos. And this painting is called The Redenção de Cão in Portuguese, or The Redemption of Ham. And in this painting, we see a young mixed race woman holding a child that has been sired by the white man off to the right hand side of the, of the, of the painting. But I'd like to direct your attention to the grandmother of the baby who's standing at the left. Uh, she's lifting her hands to God in gratitude that her daughter has been given, has given birth to a white baby. So while we know that race and color influence romantic relationships, I was curious about how the politics of love and affection shaped all types of family relationships, not just romantic relationships, but also sibling, parental, and extended family relationships. In this case, in this painting, you know, it begs the question of if the grandmother expresses excitement and gratitude for the white child, what does she feel if the child for the future for for a future blacker looking child right and how might how might those affective differences uh, impact or compound racial and color distinctions already present in the broader society so to study these questions of race of racial appearance of love my research is based on data collected from salvador bahia brazil um, considered to be the blackest city in Brazil and located in the most racially diverse region of the country. Now, while census data is certainly not, is certainly an imperfect measure of race in Brazil, it's still quite useful just for broad regional comparisons. So nationally, about 50% of the population defines itself as white and 43% defines itself as brown, 8% defines itself as black. And in the Northeast, particularly Salvador Bahia, Brazil, where my research takes place, whites are only 21% of the population, brown, brown uh, folks are 30, 63%, and the proportion of Blacks is two times higher in Salvador than in um, Brazil at large. So during this presentation, I'm going to put forth a provocative argument. And that argument is that love is a resource and racial features serve as a type of embodied racial capital that shapes the distribution of affection and love in families. Now, historically, there's been a tendency to frame this phenotypic diversity as an indicator, as I mentioned before, of post-racialism. And in fact, anthropologist Gilberto Freire, in his work, Masters and Slaves, idealized and really mobilized the image of phenotypically diverse families in Brazil to extol the virtues of racial mixture, what's called mestizagem, and, and to argue that Brazil was in fact a racial democracy. Now, in retrospect, that was an improbable claim, right? Considering that Brazil was the largest slaveocracy in the Americas, it imported the largest number of enslaved Africans to its shores, 10 times as many as the United States. And it was the last country uh, in the Americas to abolish slavery. Outside of, outside of Africa, Brazil has the largest number of African descendants in the world. So, to have slavery end and only decades later claim that Brazil was a racial democracy is really in some ways a, a bizarre claim to make. Now to be certain, slavery actually did create a fundamental shift in the population, particularly in the Northeast of Brazil. But instead of eliminating race or racism, the diverse population was restructured along a phenotypic continuum. Embrancamento or whitening, efforts to whiten the country really belied this dream of a racial democracy, because white elites actually eagerly predicted in the early 1900s that through mestizaging, through racial mixture, Blacks would literally disappear by the year 2012. In fact, the opposite has occurred. But whitening was not merely an ideology, it was accompanied by the subsidized immigration of over 4.6 million Europeans. Um, and the encouragement of certain types of sexual relationships designed to promote Brazil's social hygiene project. 
Now, while researchers acknowledge the purchase that this myth of a racial democracy continues to have in Brazil, they've also fiercely contested the ideology based on studies showing the structural racial exclusion. That structural racial exclusion is actually a feature of all major institutions in Brazil. So whether we're talking about economics, education, politics, culture, religion, employment, psychology, we see the impact of, of systemic racism in Brazil. And it's not surprising that given this history that racial and color hierarchy structure major social institutions, but hegemonic whiteness most perniciously reveals itself in the realm of family, not merely impacting marital patterns, but also fundamental family relationships. And those are the relationships I'm interested in studying as a sociologist. Now, for my work, theoretically, I draw on Bordeaux's notion of in-bodied capital, and I deploy this idea of in-bodied racial capital to refer to the resources and advantages that one gains from the proximity of one's racial appearances and behaviors to those of the dominant group. And so embodied racial capital yields uh, material benefits, but much less studied are the affective benefits that it also yields. So I argue, um, so I, I ask in what ways do racial features um, influence socialization and affective ties in families? And I argue that racial socialization is complex and contradictory. It simultaneously stigmatizes members with black like phenoty phenotypes and it compromises the affect of quality of relationships while also in some cases paradoxically resisting racial hierarchy. So I'm gonna hopefully show you the whole spectrum here. Now data for this project includes in-depth interviews conducted over a 16 month period with 116 respondents and participant observation in 10 core families and five extended families in a poor and working class um, neighborhood in, in Salvador. Now, I attended uh, cultural events, birthday parties, religious events. I attended the World Cup. I attended Carnival. Of course, that was strictly for research purposes, uh, along with the variety of neighborhood events. And I spent time with the families on a weekly basis. Now, preceding the official interview period or the, my interview process with the families, in Salvador, I spent several months just um, with Brazilians in informal settings in order to learn the lay of the land, including the racial and color lexicon, social norms and expectations, and how to navigate how readings of my own racialized, gendered, and sexualized body would influence my, my contact with families and my day-to-day -day life in Salvador. And it was through those experiences that I identified a community contact who introduced me to the families that would serve as the, the foundation, the basis of this study. Now, one of the questions that I am almost always asked is, you're a sociologist, why do you study affection? Why do emotions matter? How does love matter as it relates to inequality? And in terms of why this particular line of inquiry into racial features and socialization is significant to me, I offer to you a quote from Anna, a black student at a local university in Salvador, who whispered this to me in a conversation about race, phenotype, and family. She said, ah, yes, in a family, people are happy to have children. They have the dark one first, but when the white one comes, everything changes. The white one is treated well, and the dark one is forgotten. The black one is punished because it is said to have the face of a slave. So as a sociologist, it's difficult to hear a quote like that and not think about the broader implications that it has for understanding inequality. In the United States, American sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois of the black population in the US, he asked, you know, how does it feel to be a problem for society? But in this quote, what I was left thinking is, well, what does it feel like to be a problem in your own family? And how does that have a reverberating impact throughout your life? And so that's what I want to, to discuss with you all today. Now, when thinking about racial socialization and the affective realms of family relationships, I've, I've really organized my presentation to talk about several domains that I'll present in a way that shows you racial socialization over the life course. And of course, everything starts with babies, 
and well before a, ba a child is born, its potential racial phenotype is visualized and openly discussed in the family, which is what's considered the most intimate and inescapable realm where one's uh, physical appearance is interpreted and classified as argued by Patricia Pino. And this is something that I observed firsthand with Damiana. Damiana is a 28 year old black woman who is several months pregnant of when we meet and her anxiety about the baby's appearance is directly linked to her concern that her fear that the baby will be born with stigmatized racial uh, features. Now her fantasies consume her daily life as she, she explains to me and to a group of female uh, neighbors in one of her many mo moments of reflection, she says the following. She says, I have dreams about what she will look like. Sometimes she is white and sometimes she is morena. I hope she gets her, I hope that she gets her nose and straight hair from me. That's why I sit here all day and watch Jinchi Bonita on television. If an ugly person walks by, I try not to even look in their direction. So in this case, the stigma of black features is so great that she attempts to counteract them as well as she can uh, before the baby even arrives. Practices of avoiding ugly people is a seemingly non-racial attempt to control the physical appearance of the child. But in fact, beautiful people is used colloquially and interchangeably to mean white people. And so in this way, her reference to Jean Chibonita is one of the many racialized discursive features that normalizes whiteness and conflates uh, beauty with whiteness. And Damiana's constant conversations about the baby are also partially in response to the hypervigilance of her family, her female community members. She's hoping that she doesn't confirm their whispers that she might have a bahiga suja translated as a dirty womb or dirty stomach. This is a term used for women who tend to have dark skinned babies. So in instead of contesting this pejorative term as a type of gender racism, uh, there's consensus and Damiana agrees that she hopes she does not have a dirty womb. Now the moment of truth arrives when the baby is delivered and brought home and the affective sentiments that characterize these moments can move from shame and disgust to pride and each of these emotions sometimes hinge on the baby's racial appearance. So the one example I want to give you is with Dona Elena. She tells me in an interview, she says, when Neguinha was born, she was totally black. I mean, really black. When I came home from the hospital, and her father saw her, he said, ugh, where did you get that baby? Leve la givolta, take her back. And Dona Elena laughs. So while families certainly have the potential to be validating, and I'll show you examples of that later on, often in Brazil, as Nilma Gomez argues, it's in the families that Blacks learn to see whites as the standard to be achieved, and whites learn to see Blacks as the standard to be negated. Now, not only is this an example, this, this quote here of internalized racism, but the affective dimension of disgust is really the ultimate rejection and confirmation of the baby's devalued status. And it's important to note Dona Elena's laughter is part of what Dona Goldstein refers to as an emotional aesthetic, a disposition that allows Dona Elena to deflect the pain of her husband's repulsion. Moreover, as a testament to the importance of skin color and identity, their, their daughter, Neguinha, which literally means black one or, or little blackie, uh, she's been exclusively referred to this nickname to the extent that very few community members actually know her legal name. And so in this way, her skin color comes to define a significant part of her identity. Now, of course, other families have alternative experiences. Damiana, the woman who was pregnant, who I mentioned before, is ecstatic when she ultimately delivers, uh, delivers a baby girl who is unanimously viewed as perfect, white skin and straight hair. And Damiana actually distributes little plastic white babies with, with an attached label announcing the arrival of her daughter. Her eagerness to display the baby was, it was expressed in her invitation that I accompany her to introduce the baby to the neighborhood, a gesture that for me really resonates with classic studies of Afro-Brazilian families in Bahia, where researchers note that when babies were born lighter and with whiter features, they were strapped to the front of the mother's chest and displayed proudly. 
And in contrast, those with stigmatized black features were hidden on a mother's back. So Damiana, uh, as she walked around with the baby, received overwhelmingly positive feedback. And then uh, we ran into some friends of hers who said, oh, she's beautiful talking about the baby, but you really have to do something about her nose. And they laugh. That wide nose of that white nose of hers, Nadi Shatu, you will definitely have to correct that nose. You need to put pinch it down. There is no way around it. So an initial compliment quickly diverges into a conversation about how to correct the baby's wide nose. And so normalized is the system of racial meanings that comments that might otherwise be construed as insults are viewed as mere common sense evaluations of objectively undesirable, undesirable characteristics. And so laughter again trivializes the statements and suggests that the comments are merely uh, jokes until I discover that Damiana is in fact holding down the baby's nostrils several times a day at 10 second intervals. And so the embodiment of stag stigma and race mean that the body is literally the terrain of racial negotiation. Damiana's willingness to inhibit the baby's breathing is a reflection of hegemonic whiteness, aesthetic, aesthetic hierarchies, and the demands of motherhood. And as, as a warning, Damiana's close friend reminds her it's a mother's job to fix it. And this was not exceptional. It actually, the nose pinching actually occurred in five other families. One respondent recalled, I remember my mom doing this to my sisters. She would light a small candle and warm her fingers over the flame. And then she would pinch the baby's nose and hold it. They said it would correct the nose. Who wants a wide nose? I remember the women, our neighbors would shout to us from their windows, don't forget to pinch the baby's nose. And so this is what Tanya shares with me. And you'll note that female neighbors are important actors here offering legitimation and explicitly promoting and enforcing these racial modification practices. As such, mothers' anxiety, their, their anxieties derive from them having to vigilantly monitor the babies of their fam the bodies of their family members, in part because they are judged as good or bad mothers based on their ability to do so. Most interestingly, even in the absence of direct commentary about features, Lilsa, who identifies as mixed race, she explains, she explains that Atenas orações, even in people's prayers, one notices the investment of the community in specific racial features. So she notices that women at church pray differently for young women, depending on the race or skin color of their partners. So for one cousin who had a white boyfriend, the prayer was, may God give them a happy marriage. Versus the other with the black partner, the prayer was, well, let God decide what's best. These other mothers, these neighbors or mothering voices really weigh heavily on women who have to respond to this cobranza, this, this accountability and by monitoring um, their, the bodies of their family members. Now, racial socialization and specifically differential treatment based on phenotype was most evident as a crucial element of sibling relationships. So after Damiana, and Damiana is the woman who was pregnant, after she delivers her baby, she laughs while recounting to me that her precocious nine-year-old daughter cried all day when the baby was brought home. And she encouraged me to talk to her daughter about why, to find out why. This is how the conversation proceeded. What happened yesterday? How does it feel to have a sister? This is what I ask. And Hejani pauses and she looks down and she says, I ran in the house and cried all day. Well, why did you cry? And she responded, because I'm afraid of losing the love of my parents. She starts to, to, starts to whimper. And I ask her, well, why do you think that will happen? And she looks at me incredulously. She says, because of the baby. You saw her, didn't you? She was born limpina. Limpina is literally translated as clean, but it's meant, it's understood to mean white and with straight hair. I'm afraid they will love her more. Her hair won't give them as much trouble. Everybody is saying it. She will get everything and I will have nothing. And Hijani covers her face with her hands and sobs. Now, even as a young child, Hejani, a bright nine-year-old girl, understands the value of her sister's phenotypic capital. Her fears of comparison are also substantiated when she hears her mother agree with a family friend that 
Despite the baby's wide nose, at least the baby's hair didn't turn out like hers, Hejani's. And she points to Hejani as she says this. Hejani refuses to talk and is inconsolable for days. And rather than reassure Hejani that the love she feels for her will not change, Damiana's, Damiana offers a somewhat peculiar um, reassurance. She says, don't worry, the baby, she, she will get darker. Don't worry, she will get darker. But this statement actually suggests that if the baby does not become darker, then perhaps Hejani will need to worry. And so days after the birth, uh, Hejani frowns and she resents the baby and she constantly checks for any changes in the baby's skin tone and in the baby's hair texture. Now in Hejani's case, the baby eventually becomes browner, but these changes do not necessarily materialize for other respondents like Tiago and his Chiago and his siblings who share a black mother but have different fathers, one white and one um, black. And he explains, he says, they always discriminated against us in our own family. She, his mother, always repeated, you need to be more like your siblings in Salvador. You, like, you, you act like you don't want anything, is what she would say. Um, when they came to eat, we didn't eat the same food. They would eat these big fish and we would eat what was left. My brothers never had to work because they went directly to Salvador to go to school. And now I'm sure they see us as criminals because all of them had jobs. They had their children in school. They lived in Salvador studying and growing while we remained here working. They don't help us. They recognize we're siblings. They come here to the island to visit, but they act like they are lords. My mother never treated them in the same way. So Chiago, just to give you some context, Chiago's family lives in the, uh, on the island of Itaparica, which is right outside of nearby the, the main city of Salvador. All of the main resources are available in Salvador, but Chiago's family uh, remained on the island. Arivaldo, who is Chiago's cousin, discussed while we were having this conversation how his younger sister always showed off because she was lighter than, than their other sister. And he, he recalled that she would repeatedly assert to the darker skinned sister, you were found in the trash, you are not my sister. So in this case, the racial appearance of a sibling can be a liability because it can provide a sign or clue about the racial ancestry that a family might prefer to hide, leading to the black looking child be considered an embarrassment or ignored altogether. Now, in the last um, case I, I want to share with you, I, I want to tell you about Juliana, who is a 52-year-old mother of two teenagers, and she expresses great interest in me talking with her family, and she eagerly walks me over to a group of young girls and, and introduces me to her light-haired, light-eyed daughter, Adriele. And she says, when she does this, she says, look how light she is. Go on and touch her hair. She doesn't even look Brazilian. And this was just such an awkward interaction because she wanted me to stroke Adriele's, Adriele's hair. It was very awkward. She tells me about what her daughter is studying, her hobbies and everything about Adriele. And as I am leaving, I turn around to inquire about the brown skinned, wavy haired girl standing near them indifferently. And with a dismissive swipe of her hand, she says, oh, her, she's my other daughter. That's it. That's all she shares about her other daughter. And this is a perfect example of how emotions of pride and shame are shaped by racial and phenotypic hierarchies. Um, because she was standing so close to the mother, that was really the only reason why I even decided to inquire. I just thought there has to be something more with this girl who's next to her, but who she's not introducing. In this scenario, Adrielli is considered completely untainted with stigmatized uh, figure, features. And the interactions that unfold with her mother frame her as valuable and the quote unquote other daughter as stigmatized. Now, as I suggested in the beginning, uh, these dynamics become more complicated when siblings are involved. And while it seems that Hejani will actually escape constant comparison since her sister actually does get darker while I'm, while I'm there, others don't fare as well either in childhood or in adolescence. And Tanya provides an account of how that can play out. Tanya reports about her father. She says, he split us up and gave us away to other families so he could have children with her. Uh, his white girlfriend, Tanya, is black. I was six years old and the new family treated me like a slave. 
He didn't take care of us, but he took care of his new family. Hence the pursuit of forming a white or whiter family leads a father to abandon his three black daughters. And only decades later does the father actually connect with them because he's sick on his sick bed and requires care. And what's so ironic about this is that while he views them as now fit to be his bedside caregivers, they were unfit to be cared for as his own daughters. And so finally, I'd like to give you an example of a slightly different scenario involving um, another respondent, another respondent who describes her mother's abusive uh, relationship. And she says the following, let's see. She, my mother, would hit me all the time. Whenever I did something, even a small thing, she would slap me across the face. I'll never forget the day, and there was a very long pause here, when she punished me by throwing scalding hot water all over me. Betchy, and Betchy is the name that folks in Brazil call me, Betchy. She never did this to the others. I asked her, mama, why do you do these things to me? She actually goes on to explain that um, for her birthday, she was actually gifted a, a tight dress with high heels because her mother wanted to prostitute her to an older man from Sao Paulo. And so I included this quote because I wanted to illustrate the complexities of phenotypically diverse families. Overwhelmingly, it was the darker black looking family members who report this treatment. However, there were two cases where lighter skinned family members share shared experiences like these. And their experiences are also valid and worth mentioning in part because they also exemplify hegemonic whiteness. So in racialized societies, all members are socialized into the logic of racial hierarchies. And although in this case, the immediate victim in this narrative is the lighter skinned family member, the lighter skinned daughter, she's brutalized, not because her mother is ashamed of her, but because her mother is jealous and ashamed of herself. And so that's an important part uh, of this story. So there've been a number of studies sporadically conducted that examine differential treatment in families. But what does it actually do to a person to experience this on a daily basis and throughout their lives, right? And so I, I put forth the idea of affective capital to describe this. I argue that one's experiences of affection and positive emotions don't simply reflect your privileged status in the society. It actually helps to reinforce that status by serving as a type of affective capital. So in addition to receiving extra food, better clothes, better education, um, the, this affective capital is difficult to quantify, but it can actually impact a person's ability to pursue opportunities later in life. It can undermine their self-esteem and hinder their ability to develop relationships. So those in the abundance who have an abundance of affective capital are assumed competent. They're, they, they, uh, they're allowed to take risks. They feel comfortable pursuing opportunities because they've been reinforced in positive ways throughout uh, their lives. And I'll, I'll, I'll go over this very briefly, but I wanna give you an example of Elisa. And Elisa is a, is a teenager who I meet while I'm in Brazil and we take this dance class together. And um, at the end of the dance, the, the, the practice, we had a, we had a final presentation, a, a final show, but Elisa refused to get up to dance. She knew the, she knew the moves, she knew the steps, but she refused to get up and dance. And later after the show had ended, I decided to kind of ask her to talk through what, what that was about. And she explained, she said of many things, she said, uh, the way that people, when she was growing up would say that I was black, that I was horrible, she said, I hid myself to avoid being ridic ridiculed. And I use this example because it wasn't just Elisa who felt this way, but the ridicule that happens in families has a broader impact on how these folks approached relationships, jobs, uh, romantic relationships. And this, this really exemplifies the, the, the broader impact of this type of um, system, these types of hierarchies and these types of, of stigmas. And I can give a few more examples uh, for those of you who might have questions um, afterward. Now, while there are numerous examples of how racial socialization can reproduce racial hierarchies, it is important that I convey in this, com in this uh, presentation that Black Braz Brazilian families are not monolithic. In one of the five families where nose pinching was directly observed, family members simultaneously adopted a very strong and positive racial identity, asserting all of us are Black, some just lighter than others. 
of, no, of nose pinching. Some said, I would never do that. I would never do something like that to a child of mine, never. Likewise, Damiana herself, who constantly complimented the straightened hair of other women and flaunted her own straight hair to neighbors, refused to straighten Hejani's hair. And instead, she repeated this universal message that girls should be happy with the, with the hair that God had given them. But then there were these other three families that I label as consistently transgressive, who illustrated some of the most creative and subversive social, socialization strategies. The father of the Jijizuish family insists, for example, that everyone calls him Pantera Negra, the Black Panther. And this is a moniker, a nickname that he uses so that the neighbors and so that his family um, see the neighborhood projects that he organizes as a form of racial resistance. So this, this man is fascinating. When I meet him, he introduces his, himself as the Black Panther. And I make a mistake and call him by his real first name and he corrects me uh, and I, I don't make that mistake again. He describes racism as structural, he links internalized racism to the country's racist culture and he's completely refashioned himself creating this new identity, this Black Panther identity that's racially valorizing and he draws on transnational dialogues and ideas to do that. He also speaks about Pantera Negra or the Black Panther in the third person. So he refers to himself as the, as the Black Panther. The Black Panther believes this, Black Panther believes that. Um, and he has a room, a, few, a room of a large room full of, of newspaper clippings and articles that have documented his successes over time. So he wants me to see that he's not just about the talk. He, he has articles that have covered some of the organizational projects that, that, he's, that he spearheaded. His college, he, he calls his family members Little Panthers. He calls his wife the Big Panther. And his college age son and I when, I, when I visit their home, we end up discussing the boys, Fanon. He asks me about Malcolm X, uh, who are some of th those three are, are among his favorite authors. And so that's just one example of how we see families engaging in resistance uh, against these systems. He, Pantera Negra says, you know, you can't be a father to just your child. You need to be a father to your neighbor's child as well. And so he sees his, pra his, his projects is connected uh, to that. We also have Neji of the, of the Santos family. And she's perhaps the most interesting because she inverts the use of racial uh, humor. She mocks notions of white spaces and privilege. And she uses the language of slavery in day-to-day -day interactions with her, her daughters to clarify the importance of not uh, what she says, um, so, that, so that they don't confundia realidade, so they don't confuse the reality of racism in Brazil. So whereas others in Brazil rely on racial and color terms to escape blackness, she's created her own term, which she uses, uh, which she calls tojajinhos, which literally means little burnt ones. And she uses this term to describe her family members because she describes them as black, black, really black. And she means this in a very positive way. She wants to reject the idea that blackness needs to be hidden. The women in this family all wear braids. They talk about their desire for connection to African culture. But then as contradictory as all of these practices are, one of her daughter, even with all of this happening, refuses to date black men, even though she herself is black. And then finally, we have Dona Elena, the matriarch of the Nascimento family, the mother of Neguinha, who affirms that her baby Neguinha was preta, preta, mais linda. So black, black, but beautiful. And though this phrase itself suggests that, what black, that dark skin and beauty are conflicting, Dona Elena embraces her daughter's blackness and enters her into beauty competition. She links her blackness to Africa, asserting, asserting that her racially unmixed family possesses true black beauty. Dona Elena actually even accuses me of not being black enough, not looking black enough, which never happened in Brazil except with Dona Elena. She says the following. She says, everyone in my family is negro, black. There's not one person that is not black, black, black. She pauses and she says, well, listen, wait a minute. My great grandmother was an Indian woman and my grandmother never knew her mother. But on my father's side, everyone is black coming straight from Africa. 
And this is important because instead of white inflation, what researchers call white inflation, this overemphasis on white family members, Dona Elena shows black inflation. She inverts the dominant racial hierarchy. She reframes African features, which she describes as wide noses, full lips, and dark skin as authentic and desirable. And she proudly links her features and in, in, in heritage to Africa. Yet in a candid moment that I think perfectly epitomizes the complex and contradictory nature of, of racial socialization in Black Brazilian families, Dona Elena also says this only minutes later. She says, she says, our hair, pointing to both of us, Black people's hair is bad. I do not like it. I accept it on others, but for me, no. Honestly, I love my color. I like my color, you know, but my hair, no. I want to be the Black woman that I am now, except with straight hair. I would love to have straight hair. I do not like nappy hair. And again, like I mentioned, this, was the, this is the perfect encapsulation of the contradictions that we see happening sometime within the same conversation in the same sentence. Now to conclude, because I focus so much on affection in my research, I'm often asked to make a definitive conclusion about race and love and family. And in an article that I, that I, that I published on this research, I asked directly, what's love got to do with it? And I'm certainly not suggesting that these families are devoid of love and affection. In fact, most of the mothers would say that they're engaging in these racial rituals out of, out of love to protect their children from a society that is anti-Black. So the perversity of some of the rituals that evolve are really just a reflection of the perversity of a society where Blackness is stigmatized and degraded. But to answer this question of what's love got to do with it, what I would say to that is in families, the love is there. But what love looks like sometimes depends on what you look like. So I, I have a, another slide on um, Black Lives Matter, but what I'll do is I'm going to stop there because I'm sure that there are a number of questions that folks have. And if we have time, I'd like to go back and make some connections between my research and some of what, um, some of the conversations happening now uh, related to Black Lives Matter. So thank you all so much for for listening and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much for that fabulous presentation. And as you said, I'm sure that there are many questions. So I will I will start actually with Vanessa because I see that she has her hand up. Um, and if people have questions they want to put in the chat, I'll try and uh, keep an eye on the chat. Um, and if not, just put your hand up and I'll, I'll um, ask you to go ahead and talk. Go ahead, Vanessa. Thank you. How are you? First off, thank you for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, my question is kind of off topic from what we read. I actually posted this in our discussion post for the week, but after reading the, after reading um, the Colors of Love, as well as our previous text, such as Cecilia Valdez, like for some reason, I made a connection with the movie Rio. I don't know if anyone has heard of the movie. Um, and it actually did take place in Brazil. And I after so many years, I finally I noticed how like how um, people were treated differently in the film because of the color of their skin, particularly with one of the villains who was white, who had henchmen and even recruited a little boy to do like his wrongdoing, who was also black. So do you think that this matter is being presented way early to children, especially with the conflict in Brazil? Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Vanessa, that's a fantastic question. So the first part of your question is, do I think that, and I'm gonna reinterpret what I think you're saying, so tell me if this is correct. Do I think that children are introduced to anti-Blackness at a very young age in Brazil? Absolutely. I think everybody is exposed to this. And let me, let me also say this, I know that we are talking about Brazil, in the conclusion of my book, we're not just talking about Brazil. I could make the same, a similar argument about the United States, about the Dominican Republic, about the, the, across the diaspora. So I think it's important that we can make those, those connections, but you are right on track when you bring in examples of media, movies, and television shows where we constantly see these images um, 
of, of anti-blackness. And, and what that typically looks like is just like you pointed out, um, black men and black children framed as criminals, always framed as hungry or in need, black women framed as hypersexual and available and raunchy and loud. And we've seen these images before, right? You know, we um, another image that we see in Brazil are, are black women as domestic servants and only as domestic servants. And so um, what's interesting about your comment, Vanessa, is that many of the conversations happening now in the spectrum of Black Lives Matter, but even before Black Lives Matter are precisely those questions of representation. And so Black Brazilians have been extremely vocal about this. They have called people to task, especially because as I mentioned, they're over 50% of the population and, and they're not, you don't see that when you watch television or if you watch television, you see that this large part of the population continuously, continually is represented in a very small sliver of roles. So your ability to make that connection is so critical. Let me give you another example that you might be interested in just in terms of thinking about the exposure that kids are having, that, that, that people in general are having to um, these messages and how, how that shapes how they respond to alternatives. So there's a company in Brazil called Bochicario. And it, Bochicario is a, uh, they produce lotions and, and perfumes and things of that sort. They decided to run an ad that featured a black family on Father's Day. The black fam and the black family had people of different col colors where the black dad was getting gifts from his kids. The nation, Brazil, people responded and went crazy. They, they could not believe that a black family was selected to be in this ad. Um, even while Bochicadio had never actually had any black people represented in its ad in its entire history, the moment that a black family is represented, people pushed back and said, this is what happens when, when um, this is what real racism looks like. And so what, what the reason why I bring this up is that when folks are so used to seeing whiteness normalized, when anybody else gets highlighted, the, re the response is immediate rejection. It's an over response. And it's this, it's this fear of sharing space and sharing resources. But we absolutely have to talk about this, Vanessa. And I think that the sad part is that kids can't process this. They don't understand this. And so when I would watch these kids playing on the playground and replicating these messages. I mean, that it was really painful to watch because they're simply replicating what they've seen, what they've been exposed to uh, since they, since the very beginning. And in some cases, since before they even came out, people were already predicting and talking about what they would and would not look like and what that would mean for their lives. So I, I am right with you in terms of thinking about the, the damage that it does to a child to be exposed to these messages from day one and, and forever and how there, some of that is it's difficult to, uh, to unravel, but it's important for us to talk about. So I really appreciate your comment and your ability to make these connections across medias, mediums. Thank you, because I look at this as a, because I major in journalism and media studies, so I look at that in the point of view of a journalism student because I've had like assignments in the past where I have to look at like product advertisement. And there was this one instance where I decided to do Oreos because they're my favorite cookies. So I was just like, let me just do Oreos. And then I actually came across not one, but two commercials where it was like, I want to say late nineties, early two thousands, where we see like a boy, he gets his Oreo and he like, you know, when you pull it apart and put it back together. And then like when he's an old man, he opens it and he gets a chocolate Oreo and he kind of like reacts radically. And that commercial got backlash at the time because it was promoting racism, like because he had a chocolate Oreo and the way that he responded. And then like, I want to say maybe back in 2016, 2017, when Oreo had that commercial where they had a mixed racial family eating Oreos and they received backlash for that too in 2016, 2017. So I was just like, wow, like people are still thinking with that mindset and now it's being exposed to children. Yeah, and I, think, I think it's also interesting. And I wanna give, I see Kimberly, your hand is up. Let me, let me make this last comment to Vanessa. I think it's also interesting and important to consider how companies understand the tensions that are associated with race and racism. And they sometimes use that 
as a ploy. And so, you know, you have companies who actually don't care about being anti-racist, but they understand that if they produce something that's racially charged, it gets attention and it gets more um, publicity to them. And I think that um, as a journalist major, I, I love to hear that, that you're thinking about these questions in areas that are outside of sociology because it's so important. Um, I think that it's always a challenge to be able to push back and really question, okay, are they doing this? What, what's the goal here? Are they really trying to push an anti-racist agenda here or are they actually using people's racial anxieties just to bring publicity to their cause? And, and that's not something that's easily answered, um, but it's something that I think as a journalist student, uh, you're, you're perfectly poised to at least ask. So again, I, I love how you're thinking and uh, I appreciate your comments. Thank you. I see my colleague, um, Professor Holton, has a question as well. Um, Kim, would you like to go ahead? Oh, thank you. I'm um, I'm sorry for my invisibility here. I had to call in on my phone because I'm having tech issues. But I wanted to say uh, what a brilliant presentation. And thank you so much for sharing your research. I'm a professor mostly of, of Portuguese and Luso-African uh, literature. And I just thought, I mean, some of what you're saying is to me, and it could be that I, I'm not, I haven't read, you know, the current um, literature uh, around this this topic. But I remember ten years ago or so that the main, um, the idea that seemed to hold a lot of sway was that like silence dominated the discourse in Brazil of, around race, and and that silence was a was a you know, a cousin or, or whatever of the lusotropicalist thinking. And so I find your works incredible because it's, it seems to be the opposite of that. So I just, I kind of wanted to just ask you how you see, um, I mean, how you see the fruits of your interviewing and, and your research as related to these old ideas of lusotropicalism and the idea of silence? That, that is such a fantastic question. And in fact, in, in the introduction of my book, I respond to that in particular because part of my interest in Brazil was me reading those works that kept saying, black families are silent, black families are passive, black families don't have anything. To, and I, I didn't believe that. I, I refuse to believe that there, that it was that these families um, were characterized by just complete silence, that nobody was pushing back. And the reason why I didn't believe that is because those same discourses were written about black families in the United States. We were passive. We actually like being slaves, right? We're, we're happy Negroes in the field. That rhetoric sounded way too familiar for me to accept. And so I was determined to go to Brazil and to hear what people had to say. And perhaps they weren't pushing back in the way that people expect it, but I wanted to at least give a space to recognize what they were saying, how they were actually resisting, even in ways that were complicated, right? So the book is not an easy read. I, I, I don't paint, you know, not everybody is Pantera Negra, not everybody's Black Panther, right? And in fact, most families aren't. And in fact, even Black Panther's family is complicated. And that was really, that ultimately that is that is the contribution that I hope my book will make is that it allows Black Brazilian families to be humans. Humans resist, humans have something to say, and it's our job to listen and hear them and to convey that. And so um, I, I think that that was for me important. And what we also see is that if I were to do the same study in Brazil today, I think that I would also, there would be some some remnants of some of what I've seen. But what I also know is that some of the families that are involved in my book have also evolved, right? They've evolved over time. There in the book, I write about the fact that even as I was writing it, I could tell that things were changing, the tides were changing, the access to discourses and conversations, interest in transnational dialogue, um, that was continuing to grow. And that was growing, and, and Vanessa would probably be interested in this. This was growing in part because Brazilians are online at a level that hardly anybody matches. So Facebook and WhatsApp created a space for conversations to start happening. The conversations that people assumed were not happening, the thoughts that people assumed Black Brazilians weren't happening, there now was a space to start talking about this and really 
disseminating some of those ideas. And so I think that that's also an exciting part of this is that we have new venues, new ways to highlight these voices that have always been there, but we haven't always as researchers done our due diligence to make sure we bring those voices to the, to the fore. What I'll also say is this, you know, I was, what was most important to me with writing this book is how the Brazilians responded to it. And so one of the things that I wanted was to make sure this book uh, was translated into Portuguese because this doesn't matter if the Brazilians aren't reading this and feeling like it, it has an impact in the way that I, I wanted it to have and the way that I think does justice to, to, to some of their experiences. And that was important um, because number one, we don't usually do this as, as US scholars, right? We write our books and the people who we write about can't even read our books and there's a whole politics of that. Um, but what's been really gratifying is that now this work can also contribute to the work that I know other black scholars, young scholars are trying to produce. You know, I was just on a, an MA thesis in Brazil last week. And it's just so gratifying to see that my work can be used in conjunction with other works that have been written too, right? This is, my book is not the first book to do this, but it's exciting to see us push back and challenge these tropes of passivity that for so long and for so often have um, categorized the lives of marginalized folks. And we see this with, with women of all races, right? The idea that women just didn't have anything to say, they, they just passively accepted it, that was never the case. It, that, that's never the case. And so I see my work as absolutely in conversation as a critique of that and hopefully as a, as a path forward uh, for, for researchers who are, who are working on questions of racism and dealing with marginalized groups. So thank you for that question, Kimberly. That, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. That's so exciting. And your work is very exciting. And I'm going to be teaching that in my classes just to oh, <laughs> let you know. Awesome. For sure. Yes. Great. Thank you. And I'm delighted to hear that it sounds like it is available in Portuguese because I, I agree with you. I agree with you. That's so I mean, important. Even, Elena, even that, I mean, you all who, who deal with other languages kind of know some of that, but I, I, I didn't know how that was happening. I didn't know anybody who had their work translated. And so even, even the process of having to learn about that, it, it needs to be normalized, right? If we care about these communities, we have to be able to translate our work in ways that makes it um, accessible. And the translation part is actually just the first step because even the language is complex. People in my study can't read. So then it's not just the translation, it's taking it another level and thinking about community workshops. And so there's much work to be done, but I, I'm excited to, to be able to do it. So. Oh, absolutely. And we have, um, there are a few questions in the chat that I want to get to, but I also wanted to mention that Stephanie Rodriguez, who's here with us today as well, is the director of our Lives in Translation program. So she might have some questions for you about the, there she is, about the translation aspect of it as well. But there's a question in the chat from my colleague who had to leave, um, Gita, saying, mm -hmm. how is the situation, how does the situation manifest when it is siblings of a different sex and different features? Oh, that is such a fantastic question. So usually I have a, I get this, this is the question that I always get. I, I have a slide that talks about it, but I won't put the slide up. I'll say that gender matters. Intersectionality is so important. Not only does gender matter, but class matters. So in the book, I didn't do that in the presentation today, but in the book, I talk about what uh, class brings to this dynamic, um, but gender certainly matters. There is an, a tremendous amount of pressure um, put on women to fit these ideas, the mold of what beauty means in Brazil, much more so than men. I mean, Brazil has a beauty industry where the female body is at the center and that female body is also racialized and the features that that woman needs to have are also racialized features. And so because of that, we see the, the level of what I call cobrança, the, the level of kind of monitoring even more elevated when we're talking about uh, women. And the idea is that women's value is attached to their beauty in a way that it's not for men. So what was interesting is um, you would have situations where a family has a darker skinned daughter. And in some cases, they wanted her to go to school and focus more on her studies because the idea was that, look, you're not gonna get a partner, so you need to figure it out. You're gonna be by yourself, so we need to make sure you have an education in a way that they weren't like that with the lighter skinned daughter who they thought, oh yeah, you're a shoe in somebody's gonna marry you, you're good to go. Um, that that's not as pressing for you. With men, there was a lot more flexibility in terms of success. And in fact, the idea was that um, black men would have more to exchange. So when we talk about futures, 
and talk about how families dealt with um, women and men, this the projected futures were always part of the conversation. Who's going to marry whom? How do you get, how, how can you become social mobile, socially mobile? And Black men tended to have many other options for, for social mobility in comparison to Black to black women. Their bodies weren't necessarily central to that, though they could be, right? And so they had the option of, of, of playing up a hypersexual body in order to have relationships with white foreign women, or they had the option of finding um, wealth and status through some other means that would allow them to then marry a, a higher status partner. So that's what I mean by that. I'm not suggesting that black men had it easy in Brazil, but in comparison to black women, their options for mobility were, were much greater. Um, the other thing I wanna say is, is just to even talk about the significance of features. So gender shaped the significance of features. So you can have, um, so straighter hair, on a woman meant something different than straighter hair for a man. It was much more highly valued. And in fact, um, this may come as a surprise, but initially I didn't like the, the title of my book, The Color of Love, because in Brazil, what I found is that rather than skin color, hair texture seemed to be in everything that anybody wanted to talk about. So hair texture ended up having such a huge role in the book that I felt like setting this up as the color of love almost missed the fact that there, there's so much, there's a constellation of features that are being evaluated and, and put into a hierarchy and then kind of processed and, and decisions are made based on that. And using the term color really didn't do justice to how all of those fit together. And so for the question about race and or the way that gender matter, gender shapes how those different configurations of features matter. Again, um, a person's, a woman's possession of what are considered white features was much more important than a man's um, possession of those same features. And what we also see too, in terms of gender is, is, are the strategies of resistance. So if women were being pressured to straighten their hair, what we also see is that when they were challenging racial hierarchies, they were also engaging in, in hair work in a way that was a bit different from men. So I mentioned braids uh, in one of the families, but we see this whole process of, of, of wearing their natural hair and having to go through this transition of straightened hair to natural hair as being something that was distinctly uh, something that women talked about and not something that men talked about. Uh, but there's much more to be said about that. I'll stop there, but it's it, that's a fantastic question. Gender, class, even sexuality matters in a way that I didn't even get to talk about in my book, but that needs to be discussed. I see. Um, I see there are two more questions in the in the chat, and then we probably have time for maybe one more after that. If someone has one more question they wanna they wanna ask, um, or or maybe we'll do these two questions, and then maybe if you could talk a little at the end about your your new book project. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I you know I'm so excited to read it when it comes out to hear a little bit more about it before then. Um, you know, I think I'll ask you the the two questions now, and then you can tackle them in the order you wanna tackle them, maybe just for reasons of, of time. Um, so the first question is from um, Lilio, who's here. Um, and his question is, did you ever cry during these interviews? Some of these huh. reasons sound so sad to me. And if it were me, I would definitely have been crying. Yeah. Um, but um, that's, a, that's a great question, I think. And the other question, which is from Grace, who's also here, is I was wondering what is the main difference between these families in which one family thinks it's okay to treat their children worse because of the, ch the color of their skin versus the families that say they could never do these things? So. Ooh, these are both really good questions. So, Willio, did I cry? Oh my goodness. Um, yes, and, and I still get teary-eyed. I've done this talk so many times. When I talk about Hijani, who was just so brilliant. And my favorite person in Brazil was that nine-year-old girl. And so when I talk about her story, I'm all, it always makes me feel emotional because she's a real person with real feelings that I watched all of these things happen with her. So it, it's, it was definitely emotional what I'll say. Not only did it make me, it certainly, certainly I cried, um, but I also, in Hejani's case, I intervened because it, it, it felt ethically wrong to watch what I was watching and not do something. But the something that I did was a bit different. So I ended up becoming the, the neighborhood hair braider in part because I wanted to braid Hejani's hair. I wanted to show her that I could style her hair in a really cute way and show her that her hair texture wasn't bad. It wasn't horrible. It was, it was great and it was healthy and we could do all these cool styles to it. And so that was uh, one of the ways that I wanted to make a difference. And what ended up happening 
is that I start doing her hair, then I start doing other people's hair. And so then what starts happening is that everybody now has these twists and these braids. And so there, there are these small cultural changes that are happening. But for me, it was about Hijani. It, it was about, I, I need to show her. I just, I couldn't accept it. I, I It just felt wrong to just watch this and observe it and take notes. I, and, but that that's, that's part of the emotional part of the work. Um, and you mentioned um, whether I cried in, in, in this uh, research, definitely did, certainly for the second book, which I'll talk about that, uh, yeah, I, I did. Um, and I think that it was also important for me to allow myself to do that. I remember one of the first talks that I gave on a, a presentation in Brazil, uh, when I came back, and I'll, I'll jump here just because it's connected. When I came, back from the US and I presented on the, the new book, which is on uh, black women largely who are taken, taken in by wealthy white families and treated as slaves. When I came back from my Fulbright, the first talk that I gave, I couldn't get through it. I had never said the quotes in English. <clears throat> I mean, it's one thing to have processed the, pro the quotes in Portuguese, but here I was on a stage in front of about a hundred people saying this in English and it hit me. It, it was so emotional to be saying these words in English, and and it it just it became real in a way that I can't explain. And I had to you know ask them to excuse me while I kind of gathered myself. But it was the first time I had spoken about the work in a public setting like that, and I didn't expect to be so emotionally overwhelmed by talking about I mean, abuse and enslavement and things of that sort. Um, but I think it's important. I think that allowing researchers to be people, to not run from that is, is what enriches the research. And that's a challenge, that's a, that's a deviation from how we've talked about research in the past, right? The researcher is supposed to be this objective, supposedly distant observer. That was never, that was never the case with me. That was never going to be the case. And I think being transparent about it, being honest about it and leveraging it um, has been part of what's been most enjoyable about um, this work. So I appreciate that difficult question, Willio. And then to answer Grace's question really quickly, oh, what was her question? If, uh, or their question? I don't know Grace's. Okay, let me find it. Okay, I was wondering what the main difference is between uh, yes. those families in which one family thinks it's okay and the families yeah. that say we could never do those things. So this, there's actually an interesting connection between this question and the, the next book project. So that's a good question, Grace. Um, what I found was the difference was exposure to other ideas and exposure in interesting ways, right? So um, some of the consistently transgressive families had had access to all of these kind of other cultural experiences, whether it was they had access to African culture in a different type of way, they had access to books. In one case, Pantera Negra, Black Panther was interesting because he actually grew up in a white family. And it was because he grew up in a white family that he watched all of these contradictions unfold before his eyes. So while other people might have been more inclined to not be as critical about racism, because he lived in a situation where in his family, um, he, he kind of saw extreme forms of, of discrimination, he developed this consciousness that other people didn't. And that was, I was surprised at that. And the, the way that I link that, so, so I'll say structurally, it's important to have exposure. It's important to be part of communities um, where, where other folks, where you have a chance to, to listen and talk to other people, where you, um, so, so context and networks matter here. Education matters as well. Um, those were important uh, features here. But I'll, I'll, I'll say that and I'll transition because I know we have five minutes left to, to the new book project. And I'll say that Pantera Negra, was taken into a, a white family and called a, a, a son. He was another person who this happened to. I don't write about Pantera Negra in my new book, but he was another person who this happened to. Um, and the book that I've been referring to is a book where I, I delve into the stories of about a, a dozen women who in Brazil were taken into white, mostly white families, white wealthier families under the guise of adoption. And my respondents are 50 and 60 years old. They've lived for decades in these homes, um, not compensated for their work. In some cases, sleeping on the floor, being beaten and abused uh, under the guise of family. And so what the book does is that it deconstructs exactly what is that process? How did these children actually end up being transferred to these families? And most importantly, 
what are the tools of domination that are unfolding in these families that um, help us to understand how you can exploit a person for their entire lives? And in some cases, make it difficult for them to leave even when they are saying, um, I feel like a slave. I, I, I don't like this. And so there, there's, an, there, there, in many ways, I think the best example is that we talk about domestic violence as it relates to kind of partnerships and romantic partnerships. In this case, you have a type of domestic violence that's a bit different where, the, where instead of asking the women, why didn't you leave? What I wanna understand is what are the sociological, structural, financial, and affective factors that help to crystallize domination? And so the book is really revolving around the affective world of, of domination. Going back to this argument that I've always made, is, which is that love and emotions can be powerful. They can be powerfully great and they can be powerfully destructive. And my work has always been about playing with that, um, with that, with those two sides of love. Thank you for, thank you for um, that. I see there's one more question and maybe I'll tie it into a question about the new book project um, as well. The question is um, about oh. the color of love and I'm not sure yeah. you mentioned this, but how long did you spend with these families? Were we able to see the emotional changes through the years with these women when comments like these were made? I think you talked about it a little bit, but I also wonder yeah. if you could say, did you see a change over the, the 10 years that you were doing yeah. the research I, for I, the second book project? Love I love this question. Who was it, Jennifer? I love this question because I did. Um, I saw, I mean, it was 10 years. This is why I think the book is so interesting. It, it's, it's one of the few books that allows you to kind of follow the transition, right? Um, what, what was so fascinating is that for most of them, they had never spoken about this to anybody. So here I was, some black woman from, from the United States who spoke Portuguese that people couldn't make sense of because I looked like everybody else, but I, they knew I was from the US. Um, and I was circulating in places as a black woman that black women weren't really allowed to circulate in. So these, these other black women are watching me and we're connecting and they're, 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 they're asking questions and talking with me in ways that they hadn't before. So in the beginning of those conversations, almost all of them, almost all of them start off by saying, the family treats me like I'm a daughter. And it's like a como si fosse filha da familia, as though I was the daughter of the family. Almost everybody starts off like that. Like that. By the first several months, the first several months that, that starts to change because they, I start to ask them, you know, well, who, who else sleeps on the floor? You know, are you the only one that sleeps on the floor? Who else doesn't eat at the table? Who else isn't allowed? And so and what was important was that I, I, I wanted them to come to whatever conclusion they came to. I, I couldn't be, I didn't want to impose my interpretation, but the best solution, the best way that I could approach this was just asking them to kind of help me understand what I was observing. Why is it that on the vacation, everybody goes on vacation, but you are in the kitchen and you don't get to actually go to the beach. You're, you're serving everybody. How do we understand that? Um, so things definitely did change. And in some cases, I know we have a little time, but in some cases, women actually left. And this was scary for me, right? Like this is, this is not, I, I, I did not go to Brazil to do this work to, to have, to have that happen. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I also felt very, it, 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 was, it was a difficult situation. In two cases, women left these families and I felt like, oh my goodness, what's my responsibility here? They, I'm asking these questions, they're answering them and coming to the realization that, oh my gosh, I'm being abused, I wanna leave. So in one case, one woman left and um, it was when I had to come back to the US for Christmas break. And when I came back to Brazil in January, I called her and I said, and she, she said, no, you have to come sleep over in my new apartment. And so I did, I slept over and she was so excited to show me her bed and the refrigerator. And, um, but then she told me, she said, you know, when I moved here, I actually called the family and asked to go back because I didn't, I couldn't do it. And so I listened to her tell me that she went back and my heart is beating fast because I'm thinking you, you just escaped but I can't say that, right? Like I, I can't tell people what to do and I shouldn't do that. So I listened and she says, but then I, I went back, then I came back to my house and they gave me a cell phone so they can always call me. And it's, it's so much, there's only so much I can say here, 
but the relationship was complicated. If you think about this, these women for so many, many years of their lives had only developed networks with that family. So leaving meant that they had to start over, that they wouldn't have some of the resources that they had. They didn't really know anybody. And so leaving had to be supported. And I just wanted to make sure that if they left, they were okay. Um, but two of them left. One of them just recently, just last year left. I mean, this is after 10 years, she just left. Um, she has a boyfriend now and she had never had one before she's over 50 years old. Um, and so, so yeah, so I, I guess I say all of that to say, I have been able to see changes. The women would talk to me and say, even though I'm still here, Elizabeth, these conversations are so helpful. They're helping me. I know that it doesn't seem like they're helping, but they are, and I would come back each year and they'd say, these are great conversations and they're helping me. And so uh, some of them are still there. And they say, even though I'm still here, I think of myself differently because I understand my story better. So they're not necessarily leaving, but they have this other thing that comes out of our out of this relationship. But it's complicated. It, it's it, it's it's a complicate, it's a complex um, story and relationship and relationships that I continue having now. I don't even know how to exit the field, right? Like how do you exit the field when you've just cultivated these relationships and you don't. So yeah. Well, I would like to thank you so much for this um, phenomenal uh, talk. I would really like to keep you here all day because I have so many more questions for you, but I understand you might have other things to do, uh, just one or two. Um, so, so um, but I do, I wanna thank you so much. Um, and um, and I will hope that we can have you back when your when your new book comes out yes. so that you can talk more about this project um, and sort of how it continues to evolve because you're right, you can't extricate yourself nor I imagine would you want to. Yeah, um, no, it's not going to happen. And I think the other interesting thing really quickly is to make these broader connections, right? I mentioned to you all before that this was never just about Brazil. There's a whole, I mean, you don't have to go to Brazil to, to understand labor exploitation. We have labor trafficking here with young girls and young men and boys. And so these are issues that are global. We might not be talking about informal adoptions, but there are other iterations of, of exploitation that, um, is rooted in these affect, affective manipulation that that's worth studying. So hopefully some of you might take on that, that banner of, of studying some of that, some of those phenomena. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you so very much for, for being here and for this talk. Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet everybody. You all take care. Thank you for your wonderful questions and your engagement. I appreciate the, the invitation. Bye now. <laughs>